So the first order of business, first um, would be uh, this is being uh, video. This is being this meeting. Is, so the meeting is being recorded for the public to see. To behave yourselves. Terry, I stole your seat. That's good. Wanted That's to good. take that seat. It was like I like the chair itself. Right? So, um, so the first order of business would be public comment. If two members of the public here if you'd like to say anything or the other thing this is much more informal than the city council meetings you're welcome to wait until the specific agenda item comes up and address it then you can also speak now and speak here. So, would either of you like to talk now or would you like to wait until Nicole is it works for the department oh. uh, and then I would take a motion to approve the minutes of March 10th so moved. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You don't want to comment? I did. There's nothing. Okay. Nothing to no. perfection. <laughs> they were outstanding. Uh, I have no new business to propose, so we'll go right to the agenda. So the first item on the agenda, uh, which I actually put on this, was, is the watershed forestry management, and specifically about looking at this in terms of cost benefit. And so I asked Jim to speak to this, and I know that Todd Mason uh, is here to also, Todd Thompson, his wife is Mason, uh, is also here to perhaps ask some questions on that. So Jim, do you want to start us off? Sure, I, uh, I took the liberty of um, making copies of a couple of pieces of information. In there. Oh. Can I share it? Yeah. I can make this one. Do you have an extra one there? I'll, I can just share with Jesse. No, we got that. I'll read that for you, Mr. Chairman. So, Um, this is information that the councilors have, have seen before. I presented in, in the slides um, at the council meeting recently. It provides a little bit of an overview of the of the financial aspects of the forestry management program. Um, we've got uh, we've we've had costs on the order of one hundred twenty six thousand three hundred fifty eight dollars in sort of forestry related um, consulting work. We've received grants. Um, of about $42,000 that go to help fund some of that $126,000 for the work that we did. So state support for the types of forestry activities, the planning and the work that we're doing. Um, at this point, uh, the city has signed two logging contracts with uh, local companies that's resulted in uh, revenue of $46,534. So there's a balance to date. Um, it's caught the, the forestry activities that were done to date have cost the water enterprise fund about thirty-seven thousand eight hundred and twenty-two dollars. So that's sort of a kind of a summary of where we are. Um, some of the other aspects that I talked about in the uh, in the council meeting was that um, there is long-term value growth of the timber. Um, if you look at the work that we're doing now, um, some of the logging that we've done, uh, we actually have left the most valuable trees in the forest um, because they're the healthiest. And um, they're, they're the types of trees that are not um, being attacked by pests or other, or other problems at this point. So we're trying to encourage these sorts of healthy trees, including um, oak, red oak, uh, white pine, or two of the species in particular that we're trying to foster the growth of. So over time, as we clear out space around some of these trees and we encourage their growth, that's an asset to the city in terms of the value of the tree if we cut it down 20 years or 30 years from now. So there's sort of a, an investment aspect of the management that we do. Um, the other thing I, I mentioned was that we do, we do monitor the cost of the program, uh, not only for forestry, but all the work that we do in the watershed. Uh, and it's quite a bit more involved than just the forestry program, and I tried to allude to, to that in the presentation to the council. I appreciate you listening to me for like 45 minutes go on and on about these things, but Land acquisition is an important part of what we do, um, which obviously costs money to acquire land. Um, land management activities 
sometimes we do things that cost money. A lot of times the public works we do things that cost money. Um, there are a lot of um, roads that go through the watershed that we have to maintain culverts and the condition of the road to access dams or other parts of the watershed. So we do incur costs on some level for maintaining aspects of the watershed. Um, and that sort of falls into the overall land management cost. So this is sort of a more fine-tuned look at um, what the forestry costs are. And they were presented in a way, um, actually they were presented in a way that, that Chris Matera had asked the city to provide information under the, under the uh, public records request. So it was sort of fashioned in that way. Um, the last point that I made in the council meeting, and I'll, for the benefit of the board members that may not have seen that uh, presentation, the, uh, the forestry work, the, the goal of making money is a secondary goal. Uh, protection and long-term health of the watershed is the primary goal in all the activities that we do out there. Uh, and as an example, there was a lot of discussion of reforest, you know, with deforestation and these sorts of things, which I tried to dispel in the presentation that I made. But w there's one interesting number I felt in the forest stewardship plan, and that's the value of all the timber and the wood products in the watershed is like $2.6 million. But we're not cutting down those trees because the, they have value. That's, that's not the purpose of the program. What you can see because of the value of the asset that you have, if that was our goal, we could clearly be in the black very easily by going down and, and not uh, making sound decisions with the watershed land and cutting down trees without regard to water quality. Um, so that's sort of an overview of, of, of um, that aspect of the program. So, Jim, thank you for putting this together. I, I think as I, I got a lot of uh, questions about this and didn't ask all the questions that I, they didn't even occur to me at the council meeting. But um, a couple of reasons I, I put this on the agenda was people ask questions about, okay, can you explain why we need to, what is the benefit, not just the, so one is the cost-benefit analysis that's economic. The other is the cost-benefit analysis that's ecological. For example, somebody asked just the other day, well, what if, why is it so bad if we just do nothing, right? Why, why don't we just do nothing out there? And I guess that would be one question is, why do anything? What, what is the need to do that? Mm -hmm. And then the other is, and I, I just want to make sure I had this information correctly because I told people this, I think Councilor Adams actually asked that question over a, the life of this particular plan. I think you asked about what did we project would be the the overall cost. Did you ask that question? I think the answer was we, we hoped it would be about a million dollars. That is not, profit is not the main goal, but you didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. I, I was asking, I had some questions about the financial aspect, but also what I was, what I was saying was that you have one, you have one train of thought and evidence to back it up that says that uh, what exactly what we're doing is, is, uh, is, is beneficial. And you have another train of thought that says leaving it alone is beneficial, and, there, and that's backed up by certain evidence too. And um, and so if there are different, you know, if, if it's if it's if it if there's an overall financial loss, and the jury's out on whether or not it's actually the most beneficial thing to do, then is it a wise expenditure? And at that point, I think that's when Jim, you said that will eventually be in the black on it. That, that was my recollection of it. If I could, I mean, Jim, Jim is obviously the expert on this, but a point that I'd like to make is that um, we are asked by um, the state to have a management plan for these forests. If you look at the top line there, the $126,000, that's happening anyway. So this is, it's not as if we left the forest alone, we would then therefore incur no expense. Uh, and then another point that Jim has made in the past that I think is, is kind of a good one to keep in mind. There's some stuff that we have wanted to occur in the watershed. <coughs> and by adding in a, a little bit of timber, we can get that done at a small profit to us, as opposed to simply paying foresters to go out there and do what we want done, and it would be a pure expense. We can add in a little bit of forestry and and make a, a little, you know, a, a small amount of money. It's obviously we're not attempting to turn this into a cash cow. So again, things that need to be done in order, could you give an example of what? 
again, to addressing that question, people just saying, why don't you just leave it all alone? What, do you, what, do you touch, what, what needs to be done out there that has to be, you've got to do the work. I think I'd refer to, to so sort of Nicole or to... Yeah, well, I could try to address that. Okay. Nicole will, she fact checks me to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the goals of the, of, the, of the forest stewardship plan basically are to take, what well, we essentially have an even-aged forest out there. Because this, if you go back to the turn of the century, this was all farmland. Everything had been cleared. So as, as farmers moved west and the land became abandoned and, and, and no longer used for farming, you could see there was sort of a progression of, uh, of trees that were growing basically the same age um, in a way that was, um, you know, I guess natural in a way, right? But in a way that um, has caused crowding of some trees, there are disease and pests that are now attacking certain types of species. So what we're trying to do is um, come up with more of an ideal watershed forest where we have more, more diversity in both age and types of trees, which represents a more stable condition for the forest in the long run. So we're less apt to have problems with um, forest issues because of certain types of uh, extreme weather events which may knock down a lot of trees if they're sort of even aged trees and then you, you're, you're re the resulting condition in the forest is one that would cost you money to try to fix. Um, and then having more resilient trees, one's trying to improve and highlight the growth of trees that aren't, that aren't under any type of attack right now. Um, so you try to make decisions. Um, that makes sense not only from a watershed standpoint, from sort of a forest stability, ideal forest standpoint, but also these are also financial decisions. And um, there's, uh, there's a pretty good example. This, uh, back 80, 90 years ago, there was a lot of red pine plantations that were planted for the purpose of growing so that they could be harvested, harvested to um, yield some money for the water division. Now we still have a lot of these red pine plantations sort of out there, I don't know how many acres off the top of my head, but we have a lot of these red pines and they're under attack by a variety of pests and disease. So they're, they're gonna die. So the question is, if you cut them today, as, well the question is at least regarding red pine, if you cut them today, they represent an asset value to the city. In five years from today when they're dead, they, they have no asset value. And when they fall down, and they cross a path that we need, to, uh, a road that we need to keep open, or if they fall in the vicinity, or in the vicinity of the reservoir, it needs to be removed from the reservoir. Then it's a financial liability for us. We have these dead trees that are in certain areas. Then we need to spend money. We need to hire someone to go in and, and remove these trees. So a little bit is on planning from an asset standpoint. And we're going to be having another discussion with the board coming up about um, some red pines in the Roberts Meadow Brook reservoir area, where it's the same thing they'll die and there'll be a liability and you can hire cotton tree service to come in and remove trees and things and if you've ever had a tree removed in your yard you know it's a heck of a lot of money to remove one tree. So if you can come up with a way to manage your forest not only from a water quality standpoint but also from, uh, from a financial standpoint then it, it makes a lot of sense from a planning perspective to do it that way. Um, and those are some of the thoughts that have, have gone into um, the things that we're trying to accomplish. Okay. Yeah. So Terry, you just mentioned that there, it's um, a state ordered kind of situation whereby we have to have a forest management plan. And I'm curious, is there actual statute or administrative regulation that, um, you know, is it compelling us to do this? And if so, where can we find it in case we want to actually produce it for constituents? Sure. Well, we're, co we're compelled to have and required by the state to have a watershed resource protection plan. So we have uh, surface water reservoirs. We're required to have a plan that protects the watershed that drains into those reservoirs. Um, we're not required. How those? What I'm asking. I'm just asking about the the, the actual um, what it is. Is it is it some kind of statute that we can find? Is it a it's administrative? A, it's a regulation. It's a regulation. And where does it come out of? Um, it's a DEP regulation. We could send you the citation. Oh. Um, also, we're required by permit um, conditions to have certain things done. They don't mandate that you do forestry. They don't mandate that. But when you do it, they they regulate it and inspect it and look at what you're doing and want to review your plans and want to be aware of uh, the things that you're doing because it's all part of watershed protection, which they regulate. Is 
Any you know, other questions here? Tom. Yeah, uh, Terry had mentioned that uh, the $126,000 figure was a fixed cost, uh, or you implied it was a fixed cost. Could you sort of outline that or, or break that down into what those costs are? Those would be spent anyway? What I was saying is that, as Jim just alluded to, we're required to have management plans for the reservoirs and the surrounding land. Jim could speak to the finance better than I can. Sure. And, and it's possible that some of that, if we had no intention whatsoever of ever touching the trees, we might be able to avoid some of that expense. As what Jim has explained, I don't think that would be necessarily a very good idea. Okay. No, I'm, I was just curious whether that was to pay for the plan itself, that you're going to have to generate a plan every X number of years, or whether that was to maintain roads or to put in roads, or I was just sure. curious what that was. That, what that. Sure. So the 126000 I appreciate the fact that you haven't had to review this thing because you just got it, but um, <laughs> the second page has a breakdown of the, the 126. So. And they're basically um, costs associated with um, preparing for stewardship plans. So we had um, some consultants help us prepare these stewardship mm -hmm. plans, which are 10-year plans. Um, so we had plans for the Mountain Street Reservoir, for the Ryan Reservoir and West Waitley Reservoir, and also for the Roberts Metal System that's here in Northampton. Um, so it's preparing for stewardship plans. Um, some of that money was associated with doing the cutting plans for the logging contracts. And then some of it was just other types of um, uh, consulting related to land acquisition work that we were doing and some other things that are related to watershed management, um, not specifically, uh, may not directly be related to uh, logging contracts. But So the 126 was mainly, um, mainly consulting related costs. So there would be essentially one-time costs for the 10-year plan, although you have to do a plan every 10 years, so 10 years from now we'll be back doing an update to the plan that we did before. Um, I think in the future the plan will be less expensive to do because we've done the inventories and everything of the watershed, so the plans become easier as, as you do more active work. So the other thing that's important is that the city hadn't really done any um, forestry and management in, of watershed lands in over 10 years, maybe 15 years. Yeah. It's been quite a long time, so there was quite a bit of catch-up work to do in order to get the program back into place. So there were some upfront um, costs, if you will, to get on um, this aspect of watershed management back where it needed to be. And, and if I recall reading the, the stewardship plans, a lot of the revenue was going to be on the front end in the first two years. Uh, is that correct, or is that going to be sort of spread out over the whole 10 years? Is this anticipated over beyond the 10-year plan? Um, it'll be spread out over, over the 10-year period. Um, we're doing the, uh, the work that we've done to date is the work that we know we could safely do um, without uh, creating problems with uh, invasive species, things like oriental bittersweet, um, grapevines in terms of managing grapevines and the watershed is also sort of a problematic condition that needs to be addressed before we can cut in some areas. So there might be a period of a year or two where we try to get our hands around other aspects of forest health before we do more cutting. Um, but those are things that we're working on right now. But it's a 10-year plan and identifies uh, areas that we'd like to do uh, cutting. But those all haven't been laid out in terms of logging contracts. Yeah. Uh, so bringing up the, the uh, invasive species again, <coughs> I'm curious again to hear more <coughs> about the plan in terms of uh, herbicide use, how far the herbicide travels, what we can expect. Um, you know what the vision is for the use of the herbicide? Well, we haven't made the decision to use herbicides. The herbicides are mentioned in the forest stewardship plan. They were mentioned by the forester and the environmental professionals that helped prepare the stewardship plan. Um, some water suppliers use herbicides for control of beer sweet and, and other invasive species. Uh, we haven't made the decision to do that. Um, we, as I mentioned in the council, we do get paid to use the word herbicide and consider it as part of um, part, part of our professional work in managing the watershed. Um, we're working on an invasive species management policy right now that uh, includes consideration of herbicides. When we presented the forest stewardship plans to the Board of Public Works, the board was very interested and concerned about herbicides in the watershed. Um, those have not been approved by the board. We haven't talked to the board in any level of detail about using those. Um, 
and if we reach the point where we staff recommended that herbicides be considered in the watershed, it would be through uh, a board approval process where we talked about the some of the, a, a lot of questions that people would have, including the one that you just asked, which is, you know, what would you be using? How do they travel? What would the impact be? Um, it's a pretty serious matter, and we take it very serious. But um, there are water suppliers that use them, and you know, you, you have to look at it as one of the tools, whether you choose to use it or not. So there's nothing really. We're not imminently out there. Um, waiting to use herbicides. Is there some projected date of when that report is going to be prepared or when the board will be asked to uh, look at that? I would say that? in the next few months probably. <laughs> and, uh, probably in this calendar year would be my guess when we have a discussion about that. Other questions? Can I make a comment? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have followed this debate and sort of the stink around it uh, quite closely. And my only suggestion would be I'm, I'm an economist, economist by training. Um, I actually read the reports and I read the Quapin reports. And, and I think it would have been helpful as a citizen to have some sort of economic assessment done along with the environmental assessment and the stewardship plan. Just because, I mean, like your teacher says, you're showing the math, you're showing why this makes sense. and. I understand the, the economic rationale behind it, but I don't think that was explained well um, to the population. And I think in the future, because um, there are lots of questions. Um, um, the stewardship plan talks about you know creating small clearings and, and needing to put roads into that. And I think showing your math and why uh, this, set, this city is investing um, funds um, in this program, um, I, I, I just think it's a compelling reason. Um, and, and that I think we have a reasonable expectation that some sort of cost benefit analysis be done and that the math be shown. So mm -hmm. I think that would have been helpful um, in hindsight. Thanks. Okay. So moving on to the next item. Uh, again, this is something I put on there. It was about a, an update on the solar energy, potential solar energy unit on the closed landfill. I actually had most of my questions already answered because I also brought this up at the Energy Commission. But uh, then other people have asked since then, just coincidentally, so uh, Jim, if you could give us an update on that. Well, I can. Um, and then maybe I'm going to add something that I'm going to say. It's not something that um, I would say that we put it on the short-term back burner while we try to cap the landfill. Um, one of the most important things that we're trying to accomplish now is getting a stable landfill cap on the landfill before we do any more in terms of looking at solar panels and um, renewable energy on the site. Um, Ned may want to add something to that. I think the only thing that I want to add is that um, there's a lot of interest still on the landfill site as a site for, for PV, for a PV array. Um, I got an email just uh, today up from a developer who is interested in developing more ground field PV arrays within the Commonwealth. So they're trying to, people are still yeah. out there trying to identify opportunities. Uh, well, and one reason I brought this up is there's certainly interest from the public on this. I know I hear about this all the time. And part, partially it was a, one of the issues in, in my campaign was the person running against me was saying, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do this? And I kept explaining it has to be when the landfill was finally closed and capped. We couldn't do it now. And it would be, I think, a couple of questions that get raised, or, and I, I raised this with you before then, I think, I can't remember your answer, but it satisfied me at the time, um, was, is there any way to make sure we're working on two tracks here? So we're capping the landfill so that we're ready to go as soon as we can go on this. What can we do before the actual closing date? I know it's down the road when it's time when we can actually do this. Can we get it? How much can we get in place before that date so that we can get it up as soon as possible when that deadline comes? I mean, I would think, so sure. I, I, would, I would think that um, through the course of this year, this summer in particular, we need to see good growth of vegetation on the landfill. We really need to establish that growth before we go looking at doing much that might disturb it to make sure that the cap is as stable as it can be. So that would be pretty much 
this growing season 2014. But later this year you could you could issue a request for proposals for solar developers so we could start sort of the process that would result maybe in construction in 2015 mm -hmm. or something, right? Yeah. So if we issued an RFP, there would be permits needed from the state DEP on the landfill side to build something on the cap. But if we did an RFP later in 2014, we awarded a contract to, uh, to a firm in the latter part of 2014, they could do their design and permitting in sort of early 15 and maybe have something implemented in, 20, in 2015 in that construction season. So it would be something around that yeah. around that schedule. Sounds about right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's too fast to me. No, I, I didn't <laughs> expect it. They put that. So yeah, yeah. I, I, it's fun, it sounds fast to me. Too. I was hoping that um, by the time we get further into that, we'd have some feedback from Amherst, for example. Is this stuff working out? The um, the methane recovery with Amoresco has been kind of a problem. I mean, it hasn't been nearly as smooth as we had hoped. And we're not, uh, it's been a problem collecting the money. Um, although they're current now, everything is fine at the moment, but it took uh, a fair amount of legal work to get them to pay up. Um, so you're, what kind of feedback from Amherst? Because there are a number of other places in the state, uh, East Are, are they happy? Is it, is it making money the way that it's been projected to make money? Um, what do they think about their co the companies that they've yep. partnered with? Um, so that's something we could certainly begin to look at now because they're in the, Greenfield has a large solar array, correct, in East Hampton. Oh yeah, there's, a, there's yeah, quite a few. They're all over. Yeah. We could start yeah. to kind of look around who's who's the happiest of that group. <coughs> so if it, you know, if it took a year or two to to get this moving forward, it seems like it'd be a time to let us get some feedback and give other communities who are gotten a little bit ahead of us. A chance right. to see if it works out the way they thought it would. Yeah, I'm not sure we have to delay it for that because it's a number of other communities are way ahead of yeah. Amherst, for right. example. So we have a number. Um, it would be 2015 be before 2000. anything would happen, yeah. anyways. So. Yeah, I mean yes. qualifications would be a key part of picking any firm. Yeah, um, although qualifications was part of picking Amoresco, and that didn't end up being the smoothest ride that the city ever yeah. went on. But um, but clearly, you know, it's important. Good. Any other questions on that? Or? Okay. So now we're to stormwater management and flood control. You guys put that on there? Or you? Um, you just lingered from another meeting. You just, you just you want just to miss you, you want a drink about that? Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to uh, meet uh, Wednesday morning, the board is to have a look at the, the final iteration of the stormwater budget that we're going to propose to the city council, or well, I guess we're gonna propose it to the mayor. Mayor, he'll put it in. Um, so we're, we're meeting Wednesday morning to uh, make the final look at that. Um, if there are any changes that result from that meeting, I think we're looking for final approval on the 23rd. That's correct. Okay. So my understanding was that they already, the city had already put a number in that budget, correct? As if, didn't they do a budget saying as if it was gonna pass the city council? That's correct. Doing that, do, do you assume that the figure will be similar to that figure, you're just reviewing it, or do you think there could be a dramatic change in that initial figure the city was using? No, it, it looks like it's going to approach two, mil two million. Some of the work uh, for example, the MS4 permit is the permit from the state and the EPA to discharge, to collect and discharge stormwater. Um, they still haven't issued this permit. It's like, the when will it happen? When will it happen? Um, recently, they're talking about within a month or so. This month for the revised draft is what I heard. Yeah. Well, I heard that in October. And but I heard it in June. But yeah. Jim explained to me that, that even if it drags on for more months, we still have to gear up for it. We still have to be ready for it. And we might as well start doing what we anticipate we're going to have to do. If they want us to clean the catch basins, it's silly to wait until September and then still have to, ca to clean them all, except in a, a compressed time frame. Yeah. Um, we want to get a database set up so we can begin tracking the catch basins by catch basin. When was it clean last? What were the results? 
how do we get it? Which are things you're going to want to do anyway. Yeah. You want to clean the catch basins anyway. Yeah, I think my point about this, even if the MS4 doesn't come out, is that there are a lot of things in the MS4 permit that are really best management practices that would be good to improve uh, the way that we operate anyway. So those are the things that we would do anyway. But we would look at some of the other things, some of the sampling, and, and we might make decisions about other cost factors about whether we'd want to expend all the money to comply with a permit that doesn't exist yet. Um, those things we would evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis to see if it made sense to delay. Quick yeah. question, maybe I should know the answer to this, but um, I've had two different people ask me, are they going to get any kind of notice before they start getting their bills about what they've been assessed at, or will it just come in their first bill? I believe it'll probably just come in the bill. However, once we get all the feedback from CDM, we could, if someone inquired, we could give them a more accurate, is that true? Yeah, it is true. We hadn't actually thought about exactly how to roll out the bill amount other than sending people a bill. We've been getting calls from people and we can't really, we can't reply to all of the calls. I referred them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, case by case, we've, we've tried to be as helpful as we can at this point. And when we have the information, um, if we can come up with a convenient tool to let people know, Certainly the residential tiers, once we have those worked out, we could, we could announce those in advance. But all the other commercial properties that are calculated one by one, um, I'd have to think about exactly how we would do that. Other than to let people know, it, we have, we know what the, if, we, if we know the bill amounts in June and advance the bill is going out, we could, uh, we could do a press release or something saying if you really want to know what your bill is a few weeks in advance, you could call us and we'll let you know. There might be one way of doing it. And again, for residential, once we have the tiers and don't know much, somebody can just know the size of the house and they're going to know what their bill is. Right. The one last thing I wanted to mention I talked to you about, Jim, was the Community Innovate Innovation Challenge Grants. Do folks know about that? Have you applied for any of those? It's a fairly, it's probably one of the most simple uh, grant opportunities that Massachusetts offers. And apparently, a full 30% of the ones that were awarded last year were for stormwater management for towns and cities that are dealing with these regulations. And it's just a way to kind of boost um, a little bit of revenue around stormwater management. Um, and they, from everything I understand, they really are some of the easiest grants to apply for and to get and then to, uh, to do the reporting on and so forth. So I just wanted to recommend that uh, DPW look into community innovation challenge grants. I have all the contact information if you want me to send it to you, Ned. So that's a state loan program? Okay. And it's not very well known because it's only in its second year, but. Um, I may have taken a look at this. Did they, did they, um, we never applied for one, but um, after I spoke with you Saturday, I'm wondering whether, were these relatively small grants? They were like yeah, they're, you know, 20, grants. 30, 40,000, right. I think is kind of the top right. amount. I think this time around we decided not to submit for it, but mm -hmm. um, that's clearly, those are clearly the things that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. Just um, for some of the administrative pieces of this, um, it could be useful. You know, if you were to, in fact, um, send out letters or have people call just to hire someone to do that or to, you know, something like that, that could be very useful. I would imagine that, you know, 20, 30K. Could be. We try to evaluate every grant opportunity on the benefit to the, to the department when they come up, um, but we can take another look at that. I know the, they just announced a round for it yeah. um, not too long ago, so. Yeah. Um, um, I know that the uh, Steve Connor, the veteran service agent, um, they've been using one to actually to do regionalization of services, but it's, you know, he might be a good resource to, to find out a little bit more about how, how it works. But he told me that it's, it's one of the easiest grants he's ever applied for. Mm. <laughs> Anything else? Then? I thought you just wanted to toast it or something. Oh, no, no, I just... Uh, Probably is there out of habit yeah. at that line item. Well, let me just, I, I want to add one last comment. It was, because uh, this was a long process on the stormwater, and uh, a lot of that work went on in this committee or decisions. And I, I think it was a, a great process. The process itself is great. The discussion. Terry, I specifically want to thank you for 
all the work you, you put into this. I agree. I got so much feedback from our community meeting. Everybody just thought you were the greatest. So yeah. you made it so clear. <laughs> yeah. People that came in kind of angry or worried or yep. whatever, they walked away with their fears allayed and they were really, really pleased with your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> they thought you were really cute, too. Yeah. <laughs> they said that? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> but thank you. you did, did you make them a list? Yeah, I did. I, I've got it, Jim. <laughs> Julie's um, still down in Vieques. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The last piece. Uh, Jim, we put two minutes here, so you're going to have yeah. to go quickly. On I, don't need, I don't need the two minutes. Okay. Uh, I sent the flyer around to the to the councilors about uh, three workshops that we'll be holding with Stephen yep. Stimson on the park. Uh, the first one's coming up April 24th from 6 to 8 at the Senior Center. Uh, it's really exciting, I think, to finally be able to work on, on that. We're hoping that people will come out and let us know what their thoughts are on, on uh, what their vision for the park would be in the future. Um, there was a film at the Academy on, on Sunday about Olmsted. It was yeah. a documentary. And uh, I strolled in there about 15 minutes beforehand wondering who on a sunny Sunday afternoon would be in there watching a documentary that will be on PBS in a few weeks. <laughs> and apparently about 600 people thought that the documentary would be a great thing to see on a Sunday. I had a hard time getting a seat in there. But um, it's nice to see people's interest. And th they had a Q&A at the end and a couple of people had questions about sort of the process for designing public spaces and how that might relate to what we're about to embark on with Pulaski Park. So it was good. Good event. Yeah. I've got a lot to say today. Um, I, <clears throat> there are two things that are kind of coming up that are kind of, uh, you know, attached, adjunct, I think, to this process. One is the vibrant sidewalks piece that's uh, kind of coming up again. We're planning on doing a series of hearings about that. and. Um, the social services committee was interested in how there might be a way to link that to the Pulaski Park uh, renovation discussion, if there's a way if we need to brainstorm a little bit about that. Um, and then the Pleasant Street, uh, whatever it's being called, that whole piece, um, are they linked in any way? Should we be linking them? Should we be talking about this as some kind of cohesive process of you know, renovation for the city. I'm just wondering if you've put thought into any of those other pieces and how they link up to Pulaski Park. Well, I think sort of the the overall um, scene within the city in terms of how it relates to the space of the park, I think, is something that gets considered when when uh, Stimson will think about the the uses for the park. Um, I don't know the specifics of the vibrant sidewalks. Um, and I just thought I understand that we'll be meetings about, Pleasant, about the Pleasant Street corridor, um, but I think being aware, being aware of these things, and making sure that the landscape architect is aware of them is important. Um, by the same token, questions have been raised about the roundhouse lot, and what's the future of that lot? And the mayor has made it clear that he's really looking at the re-envisioning of Pulaski Park as something that's so important to move ahead now and not wait to see how it might. Um, how it might be tied to something else that might happen down the road. Um, so the park is going to be sort of moving ahead in that spirit, but trying to be aware of the other issues. There are other things with um, design of downtown and the new South Street um, crossing issue and, and a number of other things that need to sort of be taken into account when the park moves ahead. So I'm just I'm wondering if it would be useful to have um, Stimson and his folks come to the vibrant sidewalk hearings or something along those lines just so that there can be that kind of um, that interplay and that they're hearing what people are thinking about in enlivened downtown from that viewpoint. Yeah. Or another just approach would be to ask I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. to ask the, s the sidewalk people have come yeah, and have open meetings where yeah. Stimson's coming up from Boston. Yeah. Um, and then we should look at cost too mm -hmm. at some point. So it could be more economical for folks to come and summarize for them what, the, what that other meeting was about. I just want to add that you know, my daughter reminded me she was on the that committee way back on the park. She was a sophomore in high school at that time. She graduated from college two and a half years ago. <laughs> and um, there comes a time, like in council, where we call a question. I think there's also a time where there's always more we can add. But I think it's time, and I think that's what the council's vote was ref reflecting a few months ago, saying, you know what, the park's really important. 
we've been talking about this almost since I became a counselor, which is now 11 years, I think 10, 11 years ago. It's time, even though there are a lot of other things, I think it's important to bring in those comments, but I think we need to focus on the park. And then other things are gonna be affected, as we said. The development, who comes in, is gonna have to deal, as many developers do, with the civic space that's there. We're saying, hey, you wanna respond to the RFP? Here's what we've got going, and your design better fit with what we've decided to do there. And that's essentially what the council decided, that it's time to move ahead. Just to be clear, I wasn't suggesting that we slow down any processes okay. or anything Great. like okay. that. I'm just thinking about how, because they're happening at the same time, they can be mutually sure. informative processes. That's yeah. We're, we're trying to make sure that we have good staff coverage related to Pulaski Park. It's a project that's being managed by Public Works, but Wayne Fyden has really been instrumental yeah. in working very closely with me on this project, it's in, as, as is Anne Marie Mojo in the rec department. So we're, we're trying to be as inclusive as we can to have everybody there, and of course Ned is involved, and he, he knows about things on the transportation side I don't get involved in every day. Wayne Fyden knows more about vibrant sidewalks and things than I do, so having all the staff people available to at least make sure that the information is making it to Stimson, yeah. In addition to just trying to get as many people as we can in these meetings, what we're hoping. Is there going to be an article in the paper before the meeting about this? We're working on a press release. We're going to talk to Chad to get something in the Gazette beforehand. And if an e if another <coughs> email that was even more than the flyer could come to the members of this group, I know if we each have a list, sir, we could send it out to. That would be helpful too. Great. Okay, that covers what's in the agenda. Could I bring up one? Sure, could, um, maybe you've been potholed to death, possibly. <laughs> um, but just a, a couple of things. Uh, obviously the potholes are, were bad this year all over the state. And, in, and they're certainly worse in sections where our roads are in poor shape, which is becoming more pervasive all through the city. Um, I, I asked um, to get a, to find out how much the city has spent of its own money on the roadways over the last 20 years. I was, I was kind of surprised it's less than I had thought. So we have Chapter 90 money, which is federal money channeling through the state. And this year is a pretty good year, but am I right? There have been years when Chapter 90's been down to near zero? On the lowest that I've seen in 15 years, I think it was about 250000 Okay, so it's, 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 it dips pretty low. <coughs> um, <laughs> other than Chapter 90, the money coming from the general fund for roads only occurred one time in 20 years. Uh, in 2007, yes. for some reason, there was $50,000 <laughs> from the general fund, and that's it. Um, so I'm just making the pitch for the, the mayor's... Uh, proposal to spend $500,000 this year. Yeah. And with that kind of big money, in the course of 64 years or so, we could start to catch up <laughs> with, with a backlog. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's a pile of money, but yeah. it's, it, does, it barely gets things going. Um, I've asked the staff, and, and the staff, was turns out, was working on this anyway, if they could um, put together a list of pavement priorities for this paving season in order. First place you're going to see paving is this street, then this street, then this street. In this order, approximately by middle of June, we hope to be here. Things happen, things come up, but that's roughly what we're going to be working on. And also to establish, I think we need to think about, and, and I'm, this is something that they're thinking about anyway. We weren't, we're not going to do Hinkley Street this year. That was going to take a big chunk of the, of the money to totally rebuild Hinkley Street. And that has been our way in years past to, to choose, you know, tackle a big project at a time. But maybe it's time we dig up like 300 yards of um, Pomeroy Terrace and just fix that awful section at the beginning. Live with the fact that the whole road probably needs new drainage when we know it needs new drainage. But just think about it strategically, how do we take the money that we do have and, and use it in the best, most strategic possible way? If we did that, would that increase the cost of doing the new drainage when it's time to do the new drainage? Sure. Yeah. Well, when are we doing that? So might be throwing the money after that. 
Well, that's the strategic piece that, that, uh, that we're looking for, and they're, that's what they're working for. It, at some point, you think, what's the likelihood we would get to, uh, Pomeroy Terrace may be a bad example, but just as an example, um, what's the likelihood that we would totally rebuild that road in the next 20 years? We certainly can't live with that first section. Right. Well, if we're talking 20 years. And so that's the kind of, that's the kind of, like, brainstorming that, that it's going on right now. How is the prioritization going to happen? Well, historically, um, or, and I shouldn't say historically, historically a city council is to come down, pound on the table, and, and get their, their road. Now? Yeah, that's a historical <laughs> method. Uh, more yeah, recently, Ish, Ish was quite good at that, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more recently, we have hired a, a company that does a survey, survey of the city streets, and this information uh, is it a three-year cycle? Four-year cycle. Four-year cycle. So they look at a quarter of our streets thoroughly each year, you know, stepping through them all. This isn't part of Williamsburg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this well. this goes into a software that takes into account mm -hmm. traffic count, uh, pavement mm -hmm. um, condition, all this sort of thing, and mm -hmm. comes up with a list of what ought to be the priorities. And that's for the rebuilding and repaving of the streets. Yes. In terms of, because I was just talking to Jim about this. I asked, did I make a fair statement saying there's a rationale and a prioritization of potholes as well? Yeah. Because that's what I'm sure a lot of us are hearing about. When are they going to fix the pothole in this street or that street? And is there a some way you decide what, what gets the pothole? I, I know we have the uh, first broken axle rule or whatever. I was going to say, if that's <laughs> that is an, that isn't exactly the common. Tire biter rule. Right. Which was the rule? Tire biter rule. Yeah. yeah. If, if, do you know about this rule? The first person who do I have this right? If one person, you know, goes through a pothole and blows their tire and axle and calls and complains, C becomes a priority. Becomes a priority. <laughs> otherwise, so you could be sneaky as counselors. I otherwise, the requests are coming in. They go in the work order system. We have crews out there five days a week. They're actually working overtime. So in the work right now. in the work order system, what would be the prioritization? What would I say to constituents right now? Say, when are you going to get to Woodlawn Street? How come we not done Woodlawn Street? Why would Woodlawn Street either be high or low on that list? Is it just to do a lottery? Is it the busiest streets first? Is it ones that are priorities, ones that we have either a claim on or there's an accident or something happened? That's a priority. Well, the so ones safety. I mean, safety. We have safety, would be safety. One. You know, we have the skimmers. They're only an inch deep. They really, don't cause much damage. We'll get to them. But the priorities so safety, are the deep ones. Safety condition. And then we'll, okay. something's really deep. Right, and yeah, it's a safety issue, liability issue. Those would be the first ones. Some residents in Ward 7 came up with a really good solution. So we have all these um, places, you might have heard by now, Ned, that there's a big problem with dog poop in certain parks. <laughs> so they're suggesting that, yeah. we take yeah. the dog poop at the end of the winter and we use it to fill the potholes. Nice. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> Can okay, I, with that final comment, I, I, I can just follow up, Terry, with, with the underfunding of roads over the past 10 years, if that continues for another 10 years, what are our roads going to look like? So, so, that's that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so basically, we have 140 miles of paved road, approximately. Um, if you figure that pavement, le a freshly paved road can be more or less ignored for 14 years, in other words, if, if, if fresh pavement should be good to go for 14 years with, with minimal oversight, then we should be getting at about a tenth of our roads or 14 miles of roadway every year to keep our road stock in nice shape. Does that make sense? The, yeah. the math? Well, what are we getting to? Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a banner year if we get over a mile of new road. Uh, there were a few years back in the 90s when there was a, when the entire federal budget appeared to be running a surplus, that there was more money available, but it was a sh short-lived. Um, so at the rate we're working on pavement now, it would be over a century before we would get back to a road that we're currently working on, which, and the roads won't last that long. Okay. Well, I so, guess that's what I'm trying to imagine. So what, we're what pushing a big problem ahead of us. We're, okay. we're just pushing it further and further out. And I could send you a link if I can find it to a New York Times article, I believe it was last year 
talking about infrastructure throughout the country, roads mm -hmm. and bridges. Mm -hmm. This is a local problem, it's a state problem, it's a national problem of huge proportion. <laughs> it's a great question. What, yeah. I mean, what's going to happen? We've seen bridges, that, that bridge in Minnesota just fall. Yeah. You know, so is that what it's going to be? Bridges, you know, just start falling and you'll close up certain streets. Who knows? Yeah, and if you think about new. Mike Ryan's uh, letter in the Gazette, yeah. he's basically said, what has, what has happened over the, uh, the last few decades is that salaries at this point consume most of the budget. I, and I, I don't know what the numbers looked like 50 years ago, but I, I'll bet if you go back a ways, it's half salary, half stuff. Now it's like 95% salary, 5% stuff, or something That's like that. Or salary too. cost, your health care. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I, you don't get rich as a city employee, but certainly the cost of carrying an employee is it's substantial. Gradually. is substantial. The health care costs are <sighs> their mind blowing. Yeah. Just the Prozac alone after this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> got it <Go> covered. <laughs> Historically, over the past four years or so, our Chapter 90 funds have been pretty much level funded at about a million dollars a yep. year. But in five years, we've gone from a $21 million backlog to a $39 million backlog. So, yeah. even though the funding is consistent, we're, still not, we're just not getting there. Okay, I'm okay, cheering sure thoughts. Yeah. I think we better get out of here. So, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.